about four Europeans who go hiking together and they really get badly lost. First they run out of food, then they run out of their drinks. The Englishman turns to the other three and he says, you know, I'm so thirsty. I must have a cup of tea. The Frenchman turns to them and he says, I'm so thirsty. I really can use a cup of wine. The German says, I'm so thirsty, I must have a cup of beer. And the Jew says, I'm so thirsty, I must have diabetes. Tonight I want to explore a story that's extremely relevant to our times, as you shall see. Moses is about to pass on. It's merely five weeks before his death and he bids farewell to his people. During this long and moving speech recounted in the book of Dvarim, Deuteronomy, beginning with the portion of Dvarim, Eila HaDvarim HaShadibar Moshe. These are the words that Moses spoke. He reviews their 40 years together in the desert. He highlights certain major events, gleaning the timeless insights and lessons from these events that the Jewish people must employ for their future journeys and successes throughout their long history. Moses describes the journey from Egypt throughout the Sinai Peninsula ultimately till the Jordanian River, which they would later cross and enter into the west bank of the Jordanian River, the land of Canaan, Canaan, which would later become the land of Israel, Eretz Israel. During their long trek from Egypt through the Sinai Peninsula, ultimately to Jordan, they encounter various nations. Some of them, actually all of them, quite antagonistic to the Israelites. Moses records during his last weeks on earth the instructions he gave the young Jews about how to deal with these nations and countries they would encounter during their trek to the Holy Land. Bring up source number one, please. You have a curriculum right below the video. It was a PDF document. Moses tells the Jewish people. God tells me, He tells me to instruct the nation. You are about to pass the border of your brother Esau, the people who live in the land of Seir, which was southeast from Israel. V'yiru mikem, they will fear you. V'nishmartem ma'oid, he tells the Jews. Be very careful. Al tizgaru bom, do not provoke them. Ki loyetein lochem me'artzachem ad midrach kaf regel. Because I will not give you from their land even a single midrach kaf regel, even a single footstep. 
even one step of the lefut, you will not get from their country. Ki Yerushala Ace of Nasati is Har Seir. The Mount of Seir I have given as an inheritance to Esau, to Esau and his descendants. Oichel Tishbiru Meitam Bekesa Vachaltam. If you want to eat food, you'll buy from them food through money and eat. And even for the water you'll want to drink, you'll pay for the water and then drink. These are the instructions Moses gives them when they are about to encounter the country of Seir, southeast from Israel. Ultimately, they would go up north to Jordan and then cross to the west. Don't provoke them. It's not yours. You don't even have a right of one inch, of one foot of territory, not a foot of land of Seir goes to you. It's not yours. And if you want to drink a cup of water in their land, you pay for it. Even water. Next, he discusses their encounter with the country of Moab, up north, east of Israel, down south, north from Seir. Source number two, Moses says in his last final will and testament to the Jewish people, We turned and we passed the desert of Moab. God told me, Don't oppress Moab, nor shall you provoke them to conflict. Because I will not give you an inheritance from the land of Moab. It's to the descendants of Lot that I have given Ur. Ur was the capital of Moab that I have given Ur as an inheritance. Don't provoke them to war. Don't distress them. Don't oppress them. Don't start up with them. It's not yours. And then Moses continues about the next country, the country called Ammon. We bring up source number three in your curriculum. God told me these words. He said, You're passing today the border of Moab, its capital of Ar. You're about to approach the children of the country of Ammon. Don't oppress them. Don't provoke them. Because I will not give you from the country of Ammon any inheritance. This is an inheritance that I have given to the children of Lot. Three countries we have here enumerated. The country of Seir, the descendants of Esau are living there. The country of Moab, the descendants of Lot. The country of Ammon, also the descendants of Lot. Lot had two sons, as we know. One was named Moab, one was named Ammon. Hence the name of these countries, Ammon and Moab, named after the progenitors, the original grandparents of the inhabitants. So God says, no war, no provocations, no oppressions, no conflicts. You will not get a foot of those countries. It doesn't belong to you. These are inheritances that were given to other nations, to other countries. This Moses tells the Jews a few weeks before he passes on, recorded eternally in the opening of the book of Deuteronomy, in the book of Dvarim. Now we all know the word Torah means lessons, instructions. Torah is not a historical document. It is also a book that contains an enormous amount of history. But that's not its primary function because there are major gaps and leaps in the historical narrative of the Jewish people that are not recorded in the Torah. It doesn't record every historical event. Rather, the Torah, as its name indicates, is a book of moral instruction. That is its raison d'etre, that is its mission statement. A book of teachings, of lessons. That's what the word Torah the word Torah comes from the etymology of the word hora'a, to teach, to guide a book of lessons. Why was this message important to be articulated? What is the moral instruction here? What is the moral message? This is a trek that was unique for that period in history when the Jewish people had to leave Egypt and enter into the land they would encounter Moab, they would encounter Seir, they would encounter Ammon. They were told not to entice them, not to provoke them in any fashion. 
Why was it recorded in the Torah? What is the moral message here? And yet, even upon simple reflection, we can see the extraordinary relevance of this message, especially as it's relevant today, thousands of years later. One of the greatest and most severe accusations hurled against the Jewish people for generations, but particularly this time, this point in history, is that they are illegal occupiers of the land of Israel. It's not their land. They are thieves. They are aliens who have stolen the land of the native inhabitants of the land of Israel, have turned it into their land. And therefore their presence there is immoral, illegal, criminal. A reporter, a prominent reporter, a reporter who has served for decades as a most distinguished conveyor of news, Helen Thomas, just a few weeks ago, after the incident with the flotilla, the ship that came from Turkey to Gaza, and broke the blockade that Israel put up in Gaza, over the, on the Gaza waters, following thousands of missiles that were launched from Gaza, targeting Israeli civilians. Israel felt, I think justifiably, that if it would not scrutinize every ship that makes its way into Gaza, soon there would be an Iranian port built in Gaza, with weapons that would endanger hundreds of thousands of innocent civilian men, women, and children in the land of Israel. And therefore, they have to check every ship. These ships that came from Turkey, they also had to examine, but they refused to be examined by Israel. A commando came down, seized the ship. You know the story, the soldiers were attacked, some of them brutally and finally, they decided to protect themselves from death through shooting, and nine people on the ship, on the flotilla, were killed. Major controversy erupted. And Helen Thomas, in her famous words, said, and I'm not going to quote it verbatim, let the Jews get out of Palestine. They have no business being there. Where should they go? She was asked, let them go back to Poland and Germany. I don't know if Helen Thomas forgot what happened in Poland and Germany, why there are no Jews in Poland and Germany. Perhaps she forgot. It's not her quote that I want to emphasize tonight. It's the mindset, it's the consciousness that can produce such a quote. It's the consciousness, the idea that the Jews are thieves. They came into strange land, they occupied it, and let them let go. And it's for this reason that Moses records this story in the book of Deuteronomy about his instructions to the Jews how to deal with Moab, how to deal with Ammon, and how to deal with Seir. Essentially, the Torah is communicating its message to the Jewish people of how to respond to the countless accusations about their immoral presence in the Holy Land. And the Torah is giving us this message. Listen ye, you ought to tell the world. Listen ye, nations, academics, journalists, diplomats, politicians. Listen ye students and defenders of human rights, of morality and of ethics. Don't preach to us, to the Jewish people, about stolen land. At a time when most tribes were slaughtering their very own children to pagan gods. At a time when immorality was the norm. 
in a milieu when parents regularly practiced the pagan values of sacrificing their own kin to pagan deities, of killing their own children, of murdering ill, weak, newborn children. In an era when cannibalism was a routine diet, when most people lack the slightest idea about the very notion of right and wrong. Jewish children growing up in a nomad desert, following decades of horrible oppression and genocide in Egypt. And now they were alone wandering in a desert. They were taught that they could not touch that which doesn't belong to them. They could not step foot into a territory that was not theirs without permission. When your great-great-grandparents were still entrenched in barbaric pagan rites, Jewish children were studying God's instructions to cultivate absolute respect for the property, nationhood, and territory of others. It was under these guidelines that the Jewish people ultimately would go in and conquer and settle the territory of Israel. Under these instructions, it comes to say here, do not buy, you can't eat flaffle or hummus or a cup of water without paying the Seirites, Ammon and Moab. No provocation. Why? It's not yours. As God says, Midrach Kaf Regal, one foot does not belong to you. One foot of Seir. After these instructions, they're told, now enter into the land of Israel. The land of Seir, Ammon, and Moab, you're not let to touch. The land of Israel is yours. What is the meaning of this? The meaning is that the very same God who instructed them not to set foot on foreign soil granted the land of Israel, the territory from the Jordanian to the Mediterranean, as his gift to the Jewish people. It's not stolen land. It's a divine gift to the Jewish people. Seir, he wouldn't let them touch. Ammon, he wouldn't let them touch. Moab, he would not let them lay a hand on. Why? It's not yours. The land of Israel, that's yours. There's one little land that is yours. No other land. That's yours. Go take it. Go settle it. And yet, the sad reality remains that this greatest argument for the Jewish presence in Israel is often not articulated and not spoken about by Jewish leaders, by Jewish politicians, by representatives of Israel, in Israel and abroad. But it remains the most vital, the truest the most convincing and the most persuasive argument in the world. People respect the Bible. Billions of Christians and Muslims deeply respect the Bible. Yet you will rarely hear a self-respecting Jewish leader getting up to the world and saying, it's not stolen land, not because of the United Nations, not because of Balfour, not because of the British Mandate, but because the creator of the heaven and the earth gave one tiny piece of land to one nation to accuse Jews living in Israel as being thieves is to accuse the French in stealing France and the English stealing England and the Italians stealing Italy and the Germans stealing Germany. In fact, it's much worse those countries ultimately at some point were conquered by the nations living there today. Might was right. The land of Israel was one country that was given to the Jewish people by the one who created the world. But we're often embarrassed to say this. It sounds too Jewish, it sounds too biblical, it sounds too religious. So we base our claim on Israel 
on this one's agreement and that one's agreement, which only backfires and comes back to haunt us more and more. And the sad part is that it reached a point that so many Jews and so many representatives of Israel have come to embrace on some level the idea that we are thieves, the idea that our presence there is immoral, constantly trying to rationalize and justify themselves and the world says what is going on it's not your land we have to protect ourselves the israelis say protect yourself from your own territory but how can you protect yourself in somebody else's territory how can you be in somebody else's story how can you build a house in somebody else's territory why don't you tell the world the truth that moses tells them if it wasn't our territory we wouldn't have the right to put our finger on it to put a foot there. Moab, Seir, Ammon, God says it's not yours. This land, we're here because God gave it to us. It's our land. And then there's something else. In the continuation of the story, God tells Moses about another nation. Bring up source number four, please. Moab, Ammon, and Seir you can't touch. But source number four, God says, I have given into your hands Sichon, the king of Emor and his country, the land of Emori. Hachel Rosh. Begin inheriting his country. His Garbay Melchama, provoke war against him. God tells Moses, the land of Amori belongs to you. Begin, begin settling it. This is yours. Moses says, I have sent messengers to Sichon, the king of Cheshbon, the capital of Amori, with words of peace. And I told them, let me pass through your land. I will go on the road. No, make a right nor a left. Sell me food for money and I will eat. Give me water for money and I will drink. I will only pass with my feet. I will not take anything of yours without money. Just as the children of Esav living in Seir did. Just like the Moavites in Ar. We went by, we paid for the food. We didn't bother them, they didn't bother us. Sichon disagreed. He said, no way. And what happened? Sichon went out to war against the Jewish people. Not just he, not even his troops, not even his army. Kalama, his entire nation. He took the entire nation, men, women, and children, the whole population, go out to declare war against the Jewish people. And the Jewish people fought back and eliminated the Amorite nation and conquered the land of Amori. Now let's understand this. The commentators ask a great question. God tells Moses, Sichoin, I have given in your hand. Start conquering the land. Provoke war. And what does Moses tell the Jews? What did I do? I sent messengers to discuss peace. But God told them that it's his. Go inherit the land. No, he said, I just went, sent messengers for peace. The Abar Benel, Don Yitzchak Abar Benel asks a great question. Let's say Sichon would have been a mensch. And he would have said, you know what? Go ahead. Use my country. I'll, you'll pay for the food. You'll pay for the drinks. No problem. Would have Moses accepted it? God told him, inherit the land. The Ramban answers that the Torah is not telling us the events as they occurred chronologically. First Moses sent messengers for peace. And then God told them to go to war, which is a difficult thing to understand, because why would the Torah change the chronolog chronology of it? Other commentators give different explanations. But I want to share with you what the Medrash Tanchuma says in Parshas Chukas, where the story is originally told about the Jews, Jewish conquest of Amori. Open the source number 5, Tanchuma Chukas of the Medrash. Zesh Amar of the Torah says, Sur Meirav Asei Toiv Bakei Shalim the Torah says, go away from evil and do good. Search for peace and pursue it. Usually the Torah never told us 
to pursue the mitzvahs, to chase after the mitzvahs. Ki yikare kansipur lefanecha. If you happen to see a nest of birds, send away the mother before you take the children. If you happen to encounter the bull of your enemy, make sure to return it. If you happen to see the donkey of your enemy that's crouching under its burden, help it. The different laws about agriculture when you come into the vineyard of your friend how to deal with it when you happen to be in these places. If you chance upon these circumstances, you have commandments. But you don't have to chase after these circumstances. You don't have to pursue them. Most of the mitzvahs, if these circumstances come to you, then you behave so and so, but you don't have to pursue it. Some mitzvahs you have to pursue, but many mitzvahs are if this and this happens, that's how you should behave. Hashalom, peace is an exception. Bakei shalom v'ratfeyu. Bakei shalom b'mkayim chavratfeyu b'makam acher. Search for peace in your own place and chase after it elsewhere. Search for the peace right here. Ratfeyu, run after peace. Even if the peace is elsewhere, even if there's no peace, go find it, go chase peace. This is how the Jews lived. Though the God told them, you start conquering it and start inheriting it. They chased the peace. They sent messengers to speak peace. In other words, what the Midrash is saying, is, there was no peace. God said, Sichon wants to destroy you. And this country belongs to you, therefore, go inherit it. But they fulfilled the verse in Psalms, Bakke Shalom Viratfeyu, not only search for peace, run after peace, pursue peace, go elsewhere and find peace, and therefore they sent messengers to Sichon looking for a peace that didn't exist looking for peace that existed in another realm, in another plane, but they were determined we're going to find peace. That was the mindset of the Jewish people at that time. Say, you don't touch. Amon, you don't touch. Moab, you don't touch. Sicha, and God says it's yours. We're going to search for peace. But Sicha not only did not respond, Sicha came out with a full-fledged war sending his teenagers, sending his daughters, sending his youth to kill and murder every possible Jew. And now the Jews fought back and defeated Sichon and conquered the land. These are not just stories of the past, these are timeless stories. The great tragedy of today is that so many Jews are embarrassed to speak the truth about the land of Israel, that it's not stolen. Open the Bible and you'll see it's God's gift to the Jewish people. Don't stutter. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. Somebody once said one of the great challenges of the Jew is that even after he finally makes a fist, the next step is, Ashamnu, Bagadnu, Gazalnu, I have sinned, I have confessed. So even when the Jew made a fist and miraculously won the Six-Day War in which the territory of Israel was quadrupled, since then we're confessing and apologizing for winning the war, for being in this land. Why are you apologizing for being in the land that God has given you? This is what's good for the Arabs. It's what's good for the Jews. It's the right thing. It's the true thing. It's the peaceful thing. It's your land. Live there. And as the story of Sichon tells us, even when there's an enemy, search for peace. Search for every way to make peace. But... The moment you realize that Sichon wants to destroy you, Sichon will kill every member of your nation, then you have the moral obligation to defend innocent life. 
and not to allow the word peace to justify bloodshed and strife. Have a good night. Rivaina Isha Laila, Rivaina Isha Laila.